We're moving on to uh, Judges chapter 10. We had, uh, we had to cover a bazillion verses last week to get through Abimelech, but now tonight be a more manageable uh, chunk. Uh, remember, Abimelech is the son of Gideon, the, who, the, who has uh, left a terrible legacy behind. Gideon's legacy was absolutely horrible. And his son uh, subsequently appointed himself as king, uh, served as king, murdered his 70 brothers in cold blood. It was just a disaster. And so now we're moving into uh, the following stage after Abimelech. Judges chapter 10, verse 1, after Abimelech there arose to save Israel Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo. So if you're the son of Dodo, oh well, that's just a bummer. <laughs> he was a man of Issachar, and he dwelt in Shemir in the mountains of Ephraim. He judged Israel 23 years, and he died and was buried in Shemir. After him arose Jair, the Gileadite, and he judged Israel 22 years. Now he had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys who also had 30 towns, which were called Hovath Jair to this day, which are in the land of Gilead. And Jair died and was buried in Camon. Now, remember like back when, uh, I believe, Matt led you through a study of Shamgar, sometimes in the book of Judges, you only get a verse in the case of Shamgar. We get one verse about Shamgar. I've preached sermons about Shamgar. There's no other information in the Bible about Shamgar except for that one verse. These two judges, this is all we know about them, but you can do some uh, study, and as you'll see tonight, we can learn a lot about uh, these, these two judges just from the things that we're able to glean out of these few sentences. All right, so during the rule of Abimelech, Israel plums to new depths of sin and rebellion. Things are about to get horrifically bad. And remember, there's always a sort of a lagging effect, if you will. There's a, God has a timetable, and consequences of sin rarely come immediately. There's always this uh, season of, there's a, you know, there, there's just a buffer there, or you know, a lag time, if you will, which is one of the reasons why uh, when people are in unrepentant sin, they always initially feel like it's paying off or they're getting away with it or it's working. Things typically don't crash immediately. They rock along and then the debacle comes. So for, for, for three years, they opted, the people of, of Israel, they opted to be led by a man who was chosen not by God but by himself. Now remember, they appointed him, they followed him, they were behind him, they ultimately stabbed him in the back, but the point being is that, uh, you know, he showed up and declared himself to be the perfect person to be king, and they could have just laughed him out of the room and went on. But instead, they funded his uh, genocide of his own 70 brothers. So basically the only thing we've seen for the last couple of chapters has been Israelite on Israelite violence, which is extraordinarily rare in the Scripture. I mean, these are the worst of times, I'm telling you. These are really, really bad times because it's, it's not that uh, God's people haven't had bad times after this recorded in Scripture and even after, you know, uh, after the canon was closed and on into history. But there's so much uh, violence amongst God's people here that it's really just shocking. Um, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Or my wife is going to quit because she was about to have a stroke on Sunday night. Thank you very much. So appreciate that. Lisa will love you. This will be online. And as a matter of fact, our new website is about to launch. And as soon as it comes online, all the Wednesday night stuff is right there on the website. You can just click it and go through it by series. And I'm trying, we're trying to, the only thing we're trying to figure out is so you can actually download the, the 
handout. So you can have it all right there for you. Okay. And we're trying to put previous stuff on there too. Um, there's a lot of people, by the way, with regards to Abimelech, that there's controversy as to whether or not he's a judge. Uh, I don't necessarily refer to him as a judge because judges were all appointed by God and he wasn't appointed by God. So, But he was a king. Uh, he was a ruler. Notice that in verse 1, Tola uh, w arose to save Israel. Judges are gifts from God. I don't know how anybody would call Abimelech a gift from God. But anyway, so here's what we see. God's people are so low, they're not even crying out in repentance, yet God sends them Tola and Jair to be their judge saviors that they're not even asking for. You see, the thing you have to see tonight is that you know, there was this circular pattern that we saw in the first chapters of Judges where uh, things would go bad, people would be disobedient, God would bring judgment, they would cry out, then God would send a judge, and then th they would have peace, and then we'd go around that wheel over and over and over. Well, you notice that wheel has come off, that we're not doing that anymore. Uh, so for the time being, things have gotten so bad, we're not even in that cycle. So people aren't even calling out, and God, it's so bad, God sends a judge, and they're not even crying out, which is, is interesting because, um, you know, sometimes we say to ourselves things like, well, you have not because you ask not, which is true. But don't forget something, that if, if we only got what the things we asked God for, we'd all be a disaster. I mean... The vast majority, the overwhelming majority of God's activity in your life has nothing to do with anything that you do, say, or don't do. That He's working because He's a good God and He's working and active. And here's a good illustration in Scripture where God's people don't cry out. They don't do anything. He just sends help to them. As you're going to see, it's going to kind of come full circle in a minute. So combined, these two judges, Tola and Jair, bring 45 years of peace to Israel. Now that was much needed because Abimelech served only three years, and in three years it was an absolute disaster. And so things just were bad when he came along. Uh, Gideon didn't leave things in good shape, but Abimelech in three years did uh, what would normally take someone 30 years to do it. Now, here's what we know about these two, two judges God sends. We know, first of all, they're ordinary men. They're not great warriors. There's going to be three more judges that come that we'll probably talk about next week or the week after that are just like this. They're called minor judges, not because they're minor in importance, because they're minor in information, just like prophets. And so we don't know a whole lot about them. They're just ordinary men. These guys aren't great warriors. They don't, they don't uh, have some, some pedigree or some obvious gift or some, you know, they're just regular people. They, they, there's no brutal oppressions that are going on. In other words, everything's bad, but there's not some, there's not, the, the, the Amorites aren't, you know, on top of the uh, Israelites or the Philistines. There's no particular group that's, that's on top of them that they're going to get saved by. That's not the situation. There's no mighty battles that are going on. None, these two guys don't win a great battle or do something. Uh, what's happening? There. Oh, it was all one screen. I didn't know that. I thought they were different screens. Just say something. Okay. So there's no mighty battles and there's no feats of strength or no amazing heroes. They're just ordinary people. Um, you might want to write down on your sheet the name Tola. I'm just going to tell you how ordinary it is. His name means worm. That's a blessing. That's a blessing. First I got Grandpa Dodo and now my name's Worm. I mean, but you see, uh, God uses him. I'm just saying, God uses him. Um, he accomplished what God called him to do. Uh, and then if, if you just, you, you, could, you don't even need me to, to, to tell. You could look at verse 3, 4, and 5, and you could figure some things out about Jair. I mean, all of you are sharp enough to know that here's a guy, <clears throat> first of all, uh, 
He reigns for 22 years. He's got 30 sons. That's impressive. His sons uh, all drive Escalades in the Old Testament, fully loaded. The sharpest ride you could possibly have in the Bible is a camel. Nothing better than that. So top of the line, everything. And they have towns named after each other. So Jair is evidently uh, somebody that God uses. He's very resourceful, and God uses his resources. So you got one guy whose name means worm, and you got another guy who's very resourceful and industrious, and God uses these ordinary men to do great things. Thanks. So God loves to use ordinary men for extraordinary moments in his plans. Now what's interesting to me about this is that I would say that we are, we are careening towards, believe it or not, after those of you that have been here uh, you know, for the last 10 weeks, we are careening towards the low point thus far. And we have seen some low points in Judges. But here at this juncture, a sovereign God who knows the beginning from the end chooses to send these two. And this is the thing. Nobody, nobody, if you, you could walk up to anybody and say, um, yeah, what two judges followed Abimelech? First, everybody's going to say, well, I don't even know who Abimelech was. But if they did, nobody knows who Tola and Jair are. You've never heard anybody teach on them or talk about them. or They're nobodies. But God used them at this pivotal moment he, he, I mean, he didn't use Samson here. He didn't put Gideon here. He didn't put Deborah here. He put all of whom are famous and everybody knows he uses these two ordinary people at this very critical juncture in time, which I think is very telling about the Lord. The great accomplishments of these men were that they were faithful. That's what made them great. You know, I've been telling you over and over, weeks on end, God doesn't call us to be perfect. He calls us to be faithful. He calls us to obey. He just calls us to be faithful. And these are, these are guys who are just faithful. Now look at what happens in verse 6. Then the children of Israel again. Now, so, so we go from three years of Abimelech, right, to 45 years of peace under these two ordinary men. So now what's happening, I'm about to tell you what happens after these two guys that, I mean, no, all we know is they did what they were supposed to do, and there was peace. Now, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashereths and uh, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of Ammon, the gods of the Philistines, and they forsook the Lord, and they did not serve him. Look at verse 7. So the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the people of Ammon. Uh, verse 8. From that year, they harassed and oppressed the children of Israel for 18 years. All of the children of Israel who were on the other side of the Jordan in the land of the Amorites uh, in Gilead. And moreover, the people of Ammon crossed over the Jordan to fight against Judah also, against Benjamin, and against the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was severely distressed. All right, so here we go. Down the spiral we go. So the children of Israel take idolatry to a whole new level. Remember I left you last week where we were making some, some uh, connecting application from the book of Judges to maybe the uh, modern day scenario in which we would find ourselves in as Christ followers, and I said that uh, the, the sin of the West or the sin of the United States of America is idolatry. It's idolatry. And I'll show you that. And the reason I say that is not because of something we do. It's because of what's being done to us. Like I think I referenced even on uh, Sunday morning. You can tell I've been thinking a lot about this. The, the people that we consider our enemies uh, have no reason to hate us and have no reason to uh, want to hurt us. There's no reason. Because we're certainly not uh, lifting up the Bible and living by biblical standards. I mean, that's not the issue. So you have to ask your, yourself a question. I mean, 
What in the world? I mean, if we were, if, if we were uh, doing the things we were supposed to be doing, then it would make sense. See, we all like to act like, you know, that uh, ISIS wants to kill us because we're Christians. Oh, are you kidding me? You don't think ISIS can watch our television programs that Sharon was just talking about? I mean, we're the most reprobate people in the world to them. I mean, they're, they're, they believe in a false god, and they're a billion times more faithful than we'll, we even dream of being. Right? Yes. So why do they want to kill us? Not because we are living out biblical principles. They want to kill us because they're idolaters who hate God. It's a, it's a spiritual issue. Think about it. Every, every enemy we have is in spiritual opposition to us. Yeah, is that not telling? Tell me, show me a, another a nation that would consider themselves, regardless of what they uh, profess to be. In other words, it's surprising to me that there's not, uh, there's not some nation somewhere that is actually living out the Bible that hates us because we're profaning the Word of God by pretending or to be Christian. Right? Well, yes. So, while, while the Christian nation goes forward, uh, everything's going down the drain, and where's the Christians? If we were a majority of a Christian nation, this wouldn't be happening. So either we're not a majority Christian nation, or whatever we are, we're asleep at the wheel. I mean, this isn't new information, right? I can't even turn the TV on. It's so vulgar. So, I mean, who are we kidding? It's all spiritual. Every enemy we have is spiritually opposed. Everyone. That's not an accident. So, you can just consider that. That it is, it's, there's spiritual dynamics. Everything that's going on is spiritual. Everything. And Sunday night, this coming Sunday night, I'll put some more pieces together for you in the, out of the book of Proverbs. But anyway. Okay, so they take idolatry to a whole new level. There, uh, now, as this is going on, the, the children of Israel are religious, and they're spiritual, and they're faithful. They remind me a lot of, uh, of Muslims. Oh, they're, they're religious, faithful, and spiritual. They're just worshiping the wrong God. I mean... What would happen if there was a verse in the Bible that said, I mean, when I was in India, uh, I was in a, um, a Muslim state, and let me tell you something. At 5.30 a.m., when the siren goes off, the entire world stops dead in their tracks, drops to their knees, faces Mecca, and starts praying. I'm talking about everything. You, you could hear a... It goes from the most chaotic craziness to dead silence, total obedience. Now, what would happen if, if there was a verse in the Bible that the God of the Bible said, well, you got to pray every morning at 5.30? If we sounded the siren in America, <laughs> uh, everybody just hit the snooze button, I'm guessing. I'm just saying, they are... They are... Uh, just miles ahead in faithfulness. Although the, the, now the little kids that we're seeing that are suicide bombers, you know those little kids have memorized perfectly hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of chapters of the Koran. Their Awana program makes ours a joke. A joke. They know, they, they learn, they know literally, I'm talking books and books and books and books and books of the Koran all by memory by the time they're eight years old. They're zealous, but to the wrong God. This is not doing them any good, but they're zealous. And now you see this picture right here of the children of Israel that are behaving just like that. That's exactly what's going on here. That's why the anger of the Lord was so hot. It's because of what's going on. So the key to understanding, because this is what I say, how could this happen? 
How, how did we get, I mean, it didn't take long to go from 45 years of peace to we just fell completely off the, the, the cliff. Here's how you need to understand this. It's disobedience rooted in disbelief of God's word. See, the behavior is wrong. So what you see happening today is, is wrong, immoral behavior. But it's not the behavior in and of itself. You have to go deeper than that. It's rooted in uh, this disbelief of God's word. Oh, well, God really didn't mean that. I mean, you know, he, he, that's not what he meant when he said that. It's, it's not that at all. It's the same old thing. Now, remember what Joshua warned about all these gods that they're worshiping are all Canaanite gods. And what did Joshua warn in Joshua 3.10? He said, By this you shall know that the living God is among you, that he will without fail, without fail, drive out from before you the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Hivites and the Perizzites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Jebusites. The same exact gods that they're all worshiping right now. See, we've moved to a new... We've never seen this before yet, biblically. Up until this point, whenever the children of Israel went off into idolatry, it was either they went to the Philistine gods, they were Baal worshiping, or they were worshiping the gods of the Amorites. It was one group at a time. But now we've got just total, oh, they're, worship, they're worshiping everything. So the worship of these Canaanite gods include... Not to be a complete list, here's just some of the, the wonderful things happening. Sex worship, religious prostitution, incest, and other forms of sexual immorality, as well as human sacrifice. Now the reason I point that out is because I always tell you, whenever we're talking about false uh, gods and false worship, the telltale sign is always, you see, that any false religion, any false god, will, no matter how well it's crafted, you know, it always begins with some, you know, just take a part of the Bible, skew it over, but, you know, it's going to be in some way mimicking the true God, but it will always dissolve rather quick, quickly into some uh, fleshly operation because that's the whole motivation behind, behind it anyway. So Satan promotes this false God and the way that people are drawn to the false god worship is because well look at all look at the way you can satisfy the desires of your flesh and so nothing changes Paul in the New Testament everywhere he goes you know he goes to Corinth he goes to Ephesus and what are they doing there there's temple prostitution they're worshiping these false gods Artemis and all these other perverted gods well they're doing that because that's what false gods do that's what, 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 what does Allah do? Allah recruits you right in and says, will you come and uh, follow me? I'm going to oppress women. I'm going to elevate you for following me. You can have total domination over all the women in this lifetime. And if you're faithful and die rightly, you're going to inherit a whole entire uh, uh, human race of virgins all to yourself for killing infidels. It's no different. Same thing you got right here. I mean, you could have wrote the Koran right out of Judges chapter 10 because that's what you got right here. So, meanwhile, the God of the Bible says in Psalm 15 about idol worship and idolatry that idols are silver and gold and they're, they're the work of men's hands and they have mouths but they do not speak and eyes but they do not see. They have ears but they can't hear. They have noses uh, but they do not smell. They have hands but they cannot handle feet. Uh, they cannot walk, nor do they mutter through their throat. But here's the key, circle verse 8. Those who make them are like them, and so is everyone who trusts in them. Whenever you begin to go down the path of idolatry, you take on the characteristics of the idol that you are serving. Okay? And so, that's exactly what begins to happen to the children of Israel. And so, it's no different than what we have today. What, what, why do I say that uh, the problem we have is idolatry? Well, on one side I say because those who uh, oppose us are idolatrous. So that tells me. See, that clues me into what's spiritually going on. Second of all, 
All you have to do is just look around for just a moment and you'd see, well, we've got the same gods rolling full steam ahead right now, don't we? We've got idolatry to pride, greed, lust, envy, gluttony, sloth, anger. Oh, yeah. Now, all of those, uh, all of those seven deadly sins, if you will, are just... Uh, they're just manifestations, they're just the eventual result of some various form of idolatry. Idolatry will always lead to, uh, it will always draw you to whatever you're worshiping, you will take on the characteristics. So that's the principle you get from Psalm 15, 8. You worship something, you become like it. You worship the true God of the Bible, and what happens? You become like him. You worship something else, you become like that. So our response will be uh, shown to us. In other words, how do we know whether we're, uh, well, how do we sniff out idolatry? How do we discover idolatry in our lives? Well, the quickest way, the simplest way to find it uh, is that it will be seen in times of stress and pain. Our life will always reveal our idols. When disaster comes, where do we turn? Where do we turn? So let's just make a little quick application so we can, let's pour a little spiritual salt in this wound for just a second. Can we not? What's the temp, what do we see today even amongst professing believers? Suddenly there's a calamity, a catastrophe, something that happens in their life that was unforeseen, this devastating situ situation or circumstance. And they're gone. You couldn't find them with a, you know, on radar you can't pick them up. Man, they're, they're off the grid. So you finally track them down. They stop coming to church. They're, they're not fellowshipping with believers. They're, you, you go find them. What's going on? Well, I'm just going through a really hard time. Now, can, let's think about this for a second. You mean to tell me that you believe the Bible, study the Bible, follow the Bible, are a child of God, calamity strikes, and you run the other way? Are you, I mean, what, this is what I always think to myself. I ought to show up to work in the morning and you're sleeping on the doorstep of the church. Right? You to be, there ought to be people in sleeping bags at the front door of the church saying, Pastor, where you been? I've been waiting on you. <laughs> yeah, amen. Let me tell you something. That's where I'm going to be. When, when, when hard times come, you run to Jesus. I mean, you don't run the other way. And so here's the question we have to ask ourselves. Now, what are we running to? If we're not running to Jesus, we're running to our idol. We're running to... Our, it's going to... Calamity and stress expose idolatry. In the Scripture, in our lives around us, we see it. Okay, verse 10. So the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, Finally, we have sinned against you because you have both forsaken, or we have both forsaken our God and served the Baals. Now remember, Baals is just a, uh, it's like saying, uh, uh, you know, I'm drinking a Coke. That could mean any kind of, Soft drink. Well, that's what Baal is. It's a generic term for false god. Verse 11, So the Lord said to the children of Israel, Did I not deliver you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites and from the people of Ammon and from the Philistines? Also the Sidonians and the Amalekites and the Moanites oppressed you, and you cried out to me, and I delivered you from their hand. Yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore I will deliver you no more. Go and cry out to the gods which you have chosen. Let them deliver you in your time of distress. Yikes! Then there are some harsh words. God is furious. Now, before verse 10, the last time the children of Israel cried out to God, believe it or not, was all the way back in chapter 6. We have not had, I mean, we, they, we've been on a bad run. It's a bad, bad run. 
So, a little modern application for us again. The heretics of our day that are in full force, they're going to teach you that the brokenness of our world is not a result of disobedience. Oh, no. But it's bad thinking. It's bad parents. It's bad experiences. It's bad schools. It's bad socioeconomic systems. It's bad entertainment. No, it's not. There's plenty of those bad things out there. And I wish I could have made that where it didn't have all them blanks. I'm sorry. But it's the only way to communicate what we need to say. But if you, if you listen to the heretical voices of our time, um, they, they have all these other explanations for all the disasters that we're facing. They won't call it what it is. No, it's not a result of disobedience. Uh, yes, it is a result of disobedience. And so are all these other things a result of disobedience. They're all things that exist, but that's not the, that's not the reason. The reason is disobedience. So let's make sure we're clear as a bell, right? The problems with the world, is not, they're not derived from these bad things. The problems in the world are derived from sin. That's where they're derived from. Every problem is from sin. Everything that's broken is from sin. It may not be sin directly connected to you or directly connected to the person who necessarily may be suffering. But it is, make no mistake about it, because of sin. Because sin is the culprit for all suffering. Remember, God's original design had no suffering, had no death, had everything that we'll eventually one day have permanently. All of those things were in effect. It was sin that broke it down, which is why creation is groaning. It's because of sin. It's all because of sin. And so all the brokenness and all the hurt and all the pain is because of sin. Sometimes it's because of sin directly connected on our part. But most of the time, it's because sin has collateral damage and that you live in a broken world. And so basically, you, you're walking every day of life on this earth is like if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, you're basically walking through a minefield. It's a miracle to me that anybody ever survives at all without Christ. I always, I leave every situation, every circumstance, every, every time I'm with one of you and we cry together and we hug and we pray, we always walk away thinking, what in the world does someone do in your situation who's not a believer? I mean, you talk about, I mean, it is literally waking up every day and walking through a minefield. Everything in this life is designed, is broken and hindered and unmended and is falling apart and will hurt you, kill you, destroy you, everything. But if you know Jesus, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Amen? You're more than a conqueror. You see, you walk in victory in Christ, but apart from Christ, you can do nothing. And really it's, well, something, fail, fall apart. Hurt, die, suffer. Yeah, I mean, it's bad. It's really bad. All right, so according to Scripture, let's make sure we got a good theology of sin before we go home tonight. According to Scripture, sin is not simply hatred of God's ways, but it's hatred towards God and hostility towards Him. In other words, this is how I want you to think of sin after tonight. I want you to think of sin as an act of war against God. Because that's how the Bible describes sin. So I'm going to give you these five uh, attributes of sin. Sin is, and it's not one of these, it's all of these. Sin is walking and working against God. Number one. Or number two. Or who knows, the numbers or whatever it is. Three. Sin is uh, rebelling and fighting against God. Rebelling and fighting. Sin is resisting and running from God. And so you've got, you're working against God, but then more than that, you're fighting Him. It's not just like, you know, your God's current is going one way and you're swimming upstream. No, no, you're trying to dam up and block up what He's trying to do. And then, 
It's running from God. And then finally, sin is blaming and blaspheming God. Because sin makes the declaration that not only is God not right and not trustworthy, but that something else is more right and more trustworthy, which blasphemes his name. But, it, but it's blaming him, saying, well, no, you've got it wrong. As if you're not, you're not the God that you say you are, because if you were, you wouldn't say the things that you say. And so when we sin, what we're doing is we're doubting God's truth in exchange, and we're exchanging it for lies. At the core of every uh, sin issue is a lie. It's a lie. So if you're, if you're counseling somebody, if you're working with somebody, which you're, you know, if it's you, whatever the case may be, trying to figure out, well, why do I do this? Why am I, what, what's going on with me? What's a, well, somewhere under there, there's a lie. Now, there could be underlying issues that are propagating the lie. But at the core down there, there's a lie that you are believing, that you're telling yourself. And so you have to stop telling yourself that lie. You have to stop believing that lie. But you can't just say, I'm going to stop believing that. I'm going to stop believing that. You have to, the Bible always says, you don't take something off without putting something on. So a lie has to be replaced with a truth. Just saying, I'm not going to believe the lie, I'm not going to believe the lie, causes you to do what? Focus on the lie. See, if I sit in my house and I go, okay, don't think about the Oreos, don't think about the Oreos, don't think about the Oreos, I'm fixing to go eat all the Oreos, right? What I have to do is not say that. i got to think about the oranges, right? Think about the oranges, think about the oranges, right? Yes. That's what you got to do. No, I don't ever think about a tomato because I'm saved and sanctified. Them suckers are not. Okay, verse 15. The children of Israel said to the Lord, We have sinned, exclamation point. Do to us whatever seems best to you. Only deliver us this day, we pray. So they put away the foreign gods from among them and served the Lord, and his soul could no longer endure the misery of Israel. I would say to you that one of the most beautiful sentences in all of the Bible is at the end of verse 16. His soul could no longer endure the misery of Israel. Because let me tell you something. Those last words we read, they were harsh, weren't they? But you know, the way God's people responded was in a very specific way. And this is the big lesson for tonight as we walk away from this time. The only solution to sin is repentance. It's repentance. Do you see what just happened there? God said, you know what? I'm done fooling with you. You go worship. Why don't you go ask the God you've been worshiping for help? And you see what they did? Now listen, they cried out in verse 10, didn't they? They said, oh God, we've sinned against you, didn't they? Yeah. But there was a lot of lip service. There was no action. Now look at what happens. I mean, read it. They, now they come with the same thing. God, we've sinned against you, but they put away the foreign gods from among them and they started serving the Lord. Now notice something. They served the Lord in blind obedience, not knowing what God would do. God didn't go first. They went first. That's You see that? In other words, it, what does it reveal? What does that reveal? That reveals motive, doesn't it? Yeah. In other words, God, we're going to serve you. It sounds kind of like the, uh, uh, the three uh, Hebrew boys in the fire, doesn't it? They say, we don't know if God's going to save us or not. We know he can, but if he doesn't, we're going to serve him anyway. So if you're going to throw us in the fire, Nebuchadnezzar, go right ahead. But we're going to serve God regardless of what happens. See, they don't know what God's going to do, but they start serving Him. They put away the false gods and start serving Him. And that's a, that's a beautiful picture right there. Now, here's what you need to understand. God doesn't deliver them because they repent. That's not why He does that. He delivers them because He loves them. 
You see, God responds to us when we repent, right? He promises that. It is a guarantee. God has given you guarantee that when you repent, He responds. Has He not? He has absolutely. He has given a guarantee to any person who will repent of their sin to save them. And He gives a guarantee to any person He saved to repent of their sin. And He'll forgive them and cleanse them, right? Yes. And so repentance is ongoing. But here's the thing. Is the, is the, is repentance just the magic key that unlocks the, I mean, in other words, is it the repentance that's the, the catalyst of the blessing of God? No. Repentance is just what initiates, what activates, what points us to, really, it's the love of God that responds. He loves us. He, the reason He responds when we repent is not because we repented. It's because He loves us. He loves us. And so He is so frustrated. Oh my goodness. So frustrated. Have you ever, so have you ever been in a place in your life where you felt like that? You know, I'm studying this passage and I'm, and I'm just thinking to myself. First, I start thinking about who I was when God saved me. I just started thinking like, I thought of all the times I used God's name as a cuss word the first 25 years of my life. I mean, I, I, I cussed him like a dog. And when I repented, he saved me. I was such a dirt bag. I was so rotten. I was so undeserving. And he saved me. And you know what? Since I've walked with God, it hasn't always been uh, perfect. And there's been seasons in my life of walking with God where, you know, sometimes it, you, you just you, you, you feel distant from God and you're, you feel dry and you're in the desert and you're, you know, grasping for things. You get tangled up and trying to, you know, uh, you, you get focused on good things, but they're not God. Different, you know, and, and then you just think, but God is so good. That what does he do? He doesn't squish us. He he brings us to places where we can where we can see in a spiritual mirror, and then he draws us to a place of repentance, and he responds to our repentance because he loves us. He loves you tonight. He loves you so much. And there is such a beautiful picture here. Listen, repentance is a constant reminder that God loves us. Every You can wake up every day and repent. Every day. There's no limit to repentance. You know that? that? Repentance ought not be a bad word. It ought to be a good word. Because repentance is God's way of saying, I love you. I love you. And I am who I say that I am. And the way that me and you can always stay in perfect fellowship is repentance. And so here's God's people at this low point. You know, sometimes when we, when we draw application out of Scripture, we can get pretty discouraged. I'm going to help you, okay, because I know I've been bombing you the last couple of Wednesdays. So I'm going to encourage you. Sunday night, I'm going to really encourage you. And those of you that serve in Awana, uh, it'll be on the website and you can listen to it. But I'm going to encourage you. But I just want you to know something. As bad as things are, and they're bad, they're not, they're, they're not uh, worse than they've ever been. They're not as bad as they're one day going to be. But that doesn't change anything. You know, that, that doesn't change the fact that, that I have to wake up every day and be faced with things that just ought not be. They just ought not be. They just ought not be. I thought I knew how, how broken society was. I thought I had a handle on the depravity of uh, the world in which we live in. But let me tell you something. Rescue 100 has, has, has taken me into a, a realm that I, I just can't even comprehend. The horrific, unfathomable atrocities 
that humankind is capable of in a civilized society. Now, how do you keep from just slumping over into a hole when you got to face these things all the time? You realize that God is still God and God is on the throne and God always, always, always always keeps a remnant and He always works through the remnant and He always speaks to the remnant and He always uses the remnant. And, and listen, I'm telling you, there's a channel running through the, 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 the core of the United States of America because that's what, we're, that's what we care about because that's who we are. There's a channel of deep, sincere, authentic Christianity. There are people who are who are walking in the power and spirit and victory of God. And God is, is speaking and using and blessing those people. He's blessing us. And He's using us. And no matter how bad it gets out there, He's going to continue to bless us and use us because we're His people and that's what He's always done. And this is just a reminder of that. That you know, it's... It's things are going to change. There's a generation coming where you know there's not going to be uh, uh, there'll, there'll be churches on every corner, but they're not going to have crosses. <laughs> they're going to have other symbols, but there's still going to be a remnant. And so you, this is how this is what I remind myself of. I say when I pray, I say, God, make my grandchildren part of that remnant, God. Make them part of that remnant. See, I don't pray, God, I, I mean, I don't want to have grandkids because I don't know what the world's going to be like. No way. Because I believe the Bible. The Bible says they're a heritage. They're a gift. I say, God, I want grandchildren. I want a bunch of them. And I pray you use them as a remnant. I want them to be followers of you. I want them to love you and obey you and walk with you no matter how dark the world gets. So we're going to persevere. No matter what, we're going to persevere. And God has a lot to say to the remnant. A lot. So you be listening Sunday night. It'll be a blessing to you. We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper after we have this talk. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. Let's pray. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your word, God. I am so grateful that, that you chose to put in the Bible that at such a low moment in time, you're your soul, it, it couldn't bear. It couldn't bear the suffering of your children anymore. God, we know tonight that everything that you say is true. And we know tonight that if your people would rise up who are called by your name, whatever the number of them are, we know that if they'd rise up and seek your face and pray, Lord, we know that you'd heal their land because that's what you say. But Lord, we need to be realistic about who we really are. And we need to be realistic about who needs to rise up. And it is the, the remnant, Lord, needs to rise up and be what you called us to be. And you don't need a majority, God. Gideon taught us that. You only need 300 to take out 125,000. So Lord, help us not to get discouraged and down by the news. Help us to Help us to be burdened and broken by the situations and circumstances we see every day in our, our world. But God, not to lose hope, not to lose faith, not to doubt that you're not the sovereign miracle working God you say you are, and that every single broken person that we meet, see, hear of, or read about is eligible if they have breath in their lungs to call out to you in repentance and receive the grace, mercy, and glorious Holy Spirit that we receive at salvation. And we thank you for that, Lord. So we love you tonight as your people. Thank you for being our dad. It's a joy to be your sons and daughters. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I love you. We don't have to... Uh...